I'm Lou Skinner, one of the founders of the Ducas Rock and Roll Band. Uh, back in the early 60s, even late 50s, uh, we had a, got a little group together to raise some money for the uh, Spring Hill mining disaster. In Port of, and uh, that happened, of course, in Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. And uh, there was about five or six of us in the band. And we raised some money, sent it over to uh, the radio station, CJCB, I think it's Cindy. And it went well, and we did a second night. I can't even remember all the musicians at the time. I know Jim Crew was there, and Fred Lawrence was there, and, and the fellow C. Salon from Port of Ass was there. And uh, we did good. So on the end of the night, Jim and I said, you know, this is pretty good. These people are actually paying money. They hear us play, and we want to play anyway. we pay them if we had to. <laughs> and uh, it went well. So it was only Jim and I and Joe Carter, a good friend of ours, started a little group called the Three Teens. And uh, we are doing a bit of old rock and roll, and Jim played drums. Gerald played rhythm guitar, and I played guitar. But when instrumentalists came, Gerald went back on the drums. Jim played rhythm guitar because Jim was a better rhythm guitar player, and Gerald was a better drummer. The drums at that time was a cadet drum that we had a lot of. Uh, well, what a racket. Anyway, that was fun. Then we met the old friend of ours, Bob Batiste, and we made a deal with Bob that if his father bought him a bass and a bass amp he could join the band and Bob had the bass guitar and amp come in but he started his own little band called the Nightlights hmm. they had a drummer Art Bragg so then we caught a deal with him and said listen why don't you and your drummer come with us and we'll have a five piece rock and roll band and they decided they'd do that thank God there wasn't too many people in Port of Ash playing music. We never, we couldn't pick and choose. We had to take, you know, we had to be friends and, and get along together and, and do the thing. So Bob and Art joined us. We became the Ducas. Because at the time we were adding people, like the three teens became, became the four teens, became the five teens. Somebody quit, became the four teens. I said, you know, this is, this is crazy. You know, the name of the band is changing every month. So I went into the store one day and I found this little pack of candy. And I didn't know how you pronounce it. To me, it's D U C A T S with Ducats. Because I know on the mainland there's the blue cats, the black cats, and all that stuff. But really, it's supposed to be Ducats, which is a Spanish coin. But we didn't know much Spanish. So we called it Ducats. And that way, it didn't matter then if we had three people or 33 people. That would be covered, you know. So but going, that's how the band really got to be on the goal but prior to that going back a little bit that I wanted to get going on guitar and I never had no money for a guitar I, I had some little $15 Stella hung on the wall I was quite happy just to look at it made me feel good to look at it so one day I found out that Wince Blackmore a friend of ours his brother had an electric guitar and I went over saying and I asked him could I have the guitar how much would he want and he said, I don't think I want to sell it to you. I don't think you look after it. I said, yes, I will. I'll look after it. All right, come over and see me tomorrow. So the next day I went over, and he had this guitar. $40. I said, that's great. $40. I'll bring you over the money. So I went home, brought back $40. And he was still reluctant to sell me the guitar. He said, will you look after it? You won't beat it up while you're throwing down landmark somewhere. I said, no, I love I want to learn to play. I think I can do it. Harry said, because I find out that you, you damaged the guitar, I'll, I'll come after you. I said, good enough. So I gave him the $40, grabbed the guitar, and I went home like a streak. I went in the house. Mom said, you got your guitar? I said, yeah. Now she said, that's your baby bonus money we took there. So be careful, and you better learn. I said, I'll learn. Now plug her in. I said, plug her in where, Mom? Plug her in the wall. So I said, well, Mom, I can't plug this in the wall. Why not? Because i got to have an amplifier. What's that? Well, and I explained to her an amplifier. Oh, my God. When your father finds out you've got to buy something else after buying this guitar. I said, yeah. How much an amplifier? I said, about $35. I 
I said, but me and Jim is going to order one and go on the F's. But we never. We got a local fellow, uh, Fred Lawrence, who became our steel guitar player back in the, when we came, got the country Ducats on the go. He built an amplifier, five inputs to the volume control. Built out of plywood, looked like a triangle thing, and that's what we got going. Jim plugged in, I plugged in, and a mic for the singer. So I kept the guitar, and I got going pretty good on it. And then as time went by, I was another little associated story with that. I was doing pretty good because I was into the like uh, getting Scotty Moore stuff off and uh, Johnny Be Good and all that. Dad came in us one day and I was there going right in town. I was so proud of well, uh, he met a Chet Atkins. He met some Chet Atkins stuff happening. You know. He said, uh, "What are you playing there?" I said, Chet Atkins and Scotty Moore and Chuck Berry. See, you're never going to do nothing playing that footages. I said, why? I said, I got it, you know, I got it down pretty good here now. Everybody thinks I'm doing pretty good. Now he said, you're not doing very good at all. He said, when you learn to play guitar like John Allen Cameron, he said, then he said, you'll do all right. I said, Cape Britain fiddle jigs. He said, yeah. So I got a little bit spoiled by that. So I called my next door neighbor, Gord, Gord Bennett. Gord was a friend of Scotty Fitzgerald. I said, Gord, come down. Oh, goody, so you're going to play rhythm for me. I said, not likely. I said, you're going to teach me Cape Britain fiddle jigs. So he started playing Cape Britain fiddle jigs, and I started learning Cape Britain fiddle jigs. No. All this stuff, and faster. Faster the better. I had to impress Dad, right? So he came in one day, and I was playing. I said, is this what you're talking about? And he said, yeah, that's it. He said, now he said, you're playing guitar. Now you're playing guitar. I said, good, because I need a new one. <laughs> Got out the Pete's catalog, and I showed him the Stratocaster. I said, if we can get this, I said, I'll play all kinds of Cape Britain stuff on this guitar. And I called Jim and said, I'm ordering a new Fender Stratocaster. He said, then I'll order a Jazzmaster. I said, of course you will. You couldn't get what I got, right? You know, that wasn't good enough. So that's what we did, and that was back in 19. That went. That was 1961. We ordered those guitars. We're gonna take a break now, Wayne. Okay. Anyway, we're October 1960, and officially, the Five Teens became the Ducats Rock and Roll Band. And it was uh, Jim Crew on rhythm, Art Bragg on drums, Bob Batiste, Bob Battis on bass. Wince Blackmore was singing, and Wince so happened Wince was the brother of the guy I got this old guitar from, and myself on lead guitar. And we're getting serious then about if we're going to be the do cats, right, let's do it right. So we went and ordered some jackets because we were big fans of the Ventures. We got these little red jackets, no collar, and that was cool. And uh, and we decided we're going to make a record. After playing the Orange All and Chick Nick Lodge so much, you know, Legion, we even got a shot in Stephenville a couple of times. That was a big thing because Stephenville was the music place for we were concerned on the island. And uh, so we decided to a mutual friend of ours that used to come to Port of Bass, he had relatives there, uh, we'd go to Boston and do a record. As Mackie Barfoot would say, we went down to do a record. So anyway, uh, they wrote us a letter. We had to send down a detailed list of the gear, which we found out after. They were very impressed that we had Fender gear, Ludwig drums, two echo units. That was super. They, I think they thought we were going to show up with Kent or Silverton or something, right? So we went down and with two cars, block full gear and the five of us, and we rec to record two songs which was a woman and stay a while. Uh, while we were there, this is untold story, while we were there, uh, the chap Yakis, Shelly Yakis, wanted us to do, just in case, record three more tunes. And we had three more tunes written. Cause we were the first one, I guess, to record uh, rock and roll tunes that was self-written. And uh, we recorded three more tunes, and they're still on an old... Uh, what do you call these old uh, LPs? Or, my God, they're much quarter of inch thick. 
and they have never been played. So we did that, and we came home, and uh, the records came out on Shelley Yak's own label, which is the Rocket label. That was fine with us, and we're selling pretty good. And just a little uh, little note, Shelley Yakis and his brother went on to be real good producers, and they produced John Lennon's uh, LP, the old rock and roll LP he put out. And uh, we we did go with that, and uh, but Art Art didn't want to be on the road playing, and so. Back in uh, sixty, early sixty-five, we just we got an opportunity through another friend to go to Toronto to do another record, which we figured we had to pay for. So we got up there and uh, and we did a record for uh, RCA. It took us, and at that time, when Art left the band, we got Joe Bolus, and by this time, the Red Jackets had become Newfoundland Tartan Jackets which was sort of a trademark for the Ducats, being from Newfoundland and all. So we went into RCA and we did the album, and we paid for it. Then they decided they would sell us, they would take us on the label. And uh, of course that led on to us getting more bookings, better bookings, making a little more money and so on. So anyway, uh, all this led to going to uh, Toronto and we stayed at my uncle's house went down to RCA, did the record. They were did it all. We did 12 tunes in eight hours or whatever else on the record. And they really loved the band. And, uh, and they decided that they would put the record on RCA. So that was a plus for us because it gave us some recognition. I guess at that time we were probably the only uh, rock and roll group in eastern Canada on RCA as far as I could find out. And uh, we came home and did a little bit of a Newfoundland tour. We did Grand Falls and Corner Brook and all this stuff. And then we got a call to come down in 1966. We came to St. John's to do the Winter Carnival. A bunch of uh, people called us and we came down. It was only probably like two days. One one night at CLB Armory and one night at the Dining Hall in, in the university. Uh, I think it was ten days later before we left. But at that time... We were going strong with all the, the Beetle gear. We had all the Beetle amps and all this stuff and the tartan jackets. And it was a bit of a whirlwind 10 days. And when we got home, uh, we decided that we would quit our jobs and make it a full-time career. Jim and I and, and Bob Batiste was full tilt for that. And prior to going to Toronto, I back up for a second. Art decided that he he was uh, involved in family business, and whatever. And we ended up getting Joe Bolus on drums. Joe was the manager of a clothing store. He said yes. He trolled that down too. Jim was with Newfoundland Telephone Company. He trolled that down. I worked with a local hardware company. Bob Battis worked with his father's company. Trolled all down. So we headed for Stephenville because Winston didn't want to do it, and got a singer by the name of Claude Keynes. I was 14 or 15 at the time. And we went on the road after that, after the poor, after the St. John's thing. And a lot of members changed in the band. Like uh, Joe Bolas had quit, and we had got Greg O'Brien's at a corner boat. Greg had quit, and we got Nipper Parsons to fill in. And Nipper was tied up with family in, in that era. And we ended up with Brother Roger, which was a surprise guest to me because we were on the way to CBC doing a, a, a TV show over there, Frank's Bandstand, and uh, I was delayed in St. John's doing band work. And when I got to Port of Bass, I just headed to the board the boat, got aboard the boat, and we'll be old. Greg O'Blinus had quit, stayed in corner on the way across, and Roger, Roger was aboard the boat with the band practicing that's how he ended up in the band on the quick for that I think there was some influence there with Jim Crew and Bob Battis though they don't really tell me much about it but I'm pretty sure that was there but either way I took the crap home it was my fault you know mom and dad had it in for me I'll tell you that much so we went on then and uh, the membership had changed a lot but we decided we'd stay on the road and the band was well liked. We traveled uh, to Boston. We did the Boston thing and uh, one gig in New York. We did uh, P. 
PEI, Montreal, Toronto, Labrador, Halifax. That was our circle. But uh, I, I missed one spot there. When we left the RCA studios, the manager of the station there, Gilmuster, I think his name was, Ed Ancho, he wanted us to go down to New York, Royal York Hotel to meet uh, the band leader down there, Moxie Whitney. Moxie was the band leader for the big orchestra at the hotel. And he thought we should hook up with him because he had a lot of contacts and could do good for the band. So we went in his office, and he all back his curtain, and he had a tape going of the Ducats at the session that happened the day before, and we thought, oh, gee, how did he get that that fast, right? He loved the band, and he made a remark that even though this was a rock and roll band, there was a little bit of country guitar going on, and things were really different. It was different enough that he could market us and even put the orchestra behind us at times. And we thanked him, and we went on, and we said, ah, I don't involve in that big of orchestra, to be honest. We don't want that. How come he had that tape there right away behind, had the tape recorder right away behind the curtain? You know? This is stupid stuff we went on with, you know, like not knowing the business, not realizing how powerful these guys were and how little we were, you know? But we didn't follow through on that. But the record did good. The recognition was good. Got us bookings. And I guess we became, like a lot of other bands, we became uh, equipment rich and penny poor, you know. A lot of fun, a lot of good recognition. Uh, PEI was good. Uh, Labrador, doing all the American bases. We did mm. we did all the bases. And uh, after a lot of years on the road, uh, playing all the eastern Canada and down around the American eastern seaboard area, uh, we decided that uh, the road life wasn't what we thought it would be. And the problem, I think, was, and, and other members of the band would agree, that we never got into uh, the business end of the music business. We were more concerned about having new strings on our guitar and, and sounding good, you know. Uh, like Jim Crew always said, that we would have done a lot better if none of us had nothing to say about nothing and had a proper manager who would say, you do this, you do that, you go there, you go there, and all we had to do was worry about our instruments. We would have done it right, but we decided we wanted to come off the road. Everybody had their reason. Jim wanted to go back to Port of Bass for a, a, a business he was working on and so on. So we, the majority of us moved here in St. John's, and the whole mill at the time was the place where the Ducats played the most probably the only place we wanted to play actually and we made that the home base we played on Old Mill a lot Scott Mercer was the manager there he did a lot for us with regard to who can result with these American uh, companies and agents and whatever and uh, matter of fact one one time he uh, made arrangements for Claude Keynes to fly from here to New York to sing without a guitar in a fellow's living room and fly back again the same night and the guy liked Claude singing. He thought he sounded bluesy, whatever. And they, they called us and said that they wanted to sign us up to uh, their new label they were working on. And we said, well, that sounds good. And they had some new acts. One of the acts was Tree Girls. Some girl, Ross, didn't mean nothing to us at the time. And they're going to call themselves the Supremes. And we said, oh, that sounds good. They're going on the charts. They're going on the Ed Sullivan Show, guaranteed. And you guys can sign up with this con with this company, and you're on your way. And we said, I don't know. Well, we were saying to ourselves, you know, we don't know. We're just crowd from the out of Detroit somewhere. My God, you know. But this was Motown Records, and the group was uh, uh, Diana Ross and Supremes, and we were reluctant to get involved because we thought that, you know, that. Being a white rock and roll band, how was this going to fit in with the with all the colored uh, musicians and blues and all this stuff? And there again, from the business end of everything, we didn't realize what they were saying to us. And we made a decision based on lack of knowledge, I guess you call it, of the music business. So we didn't do that. So we just stayed home, played the whole mill, did our thing. Eventually the band uh, dispersed. 
Everybody went their own way. And some of us stayed in St. John's. We decided, well, okay, country music's coming on big now. we got R.E.F.'s show band and all this. So we went and found a country singer and a steel guitar player. Fred Lawrence played steel, and we found this fellow, Eddie Rousseau, who became Eddie Eastman. And uh, we became a country band. Uh, Bob didn't like country music that much, so Bob had a, a good business deal on the go, so he put more time in that. And Fred's wife, Kathy, became our bass player. And But a good thing came out of that, and we went over to the Bank of Commerce. We got a loan of $5,000, and myself and Eddie took off for Nashville. I had I had had an agenda with that myself, because the studio I booked was a place called... Uh, Woodland Studios that was owned by Scotty Moore and this was an opportunity for me to meet my guitar hero Scotty Moore hopefully play with him sure enough I called Scotty got the studio booked me and Eddie went down and we had Scotty Moore we had DJ Fontana which is two prime guys with Elvis Willie Rainsford on piano Elvis' early piano player. We had Pete Drake on steel guitar. He was the master. And so all these good musicians and people that we looked up to, you know. And uh, that was cool. We came up with a record. Eddie Eastman got recognition. The band got recognition all over again in a different venue. And enough so that Eddie left and went out to Toronto and became uh, well-known in the country business. Got a few junior awards. And... Uh, we got, I got to meet these people, and we, to this day, we uh, we're still communicate. We're friends. That was great. And at the time all this was happening, uh, I got in contact with Minnie White out in the Colorado Valley. And Minnie was in the kitchen, but she was a good accordion player, and she wouldn't go into the studio. So I made it, and she had an accordion that wasn't really that good. So I made a deal with her. I said, Look, I'll buy you a new accordion, and I'll put Duke Aspie on you in the studio if you get out of the kitchen and, and, and get into the music business. And she agreed. And then, of course, she went on. She got her own story. She did well. She got her Juno Award. She got the, she was made a, given the Order of Canada. So we, I think our old, our old music life, other than pushing the Duke Cats and having fun, getting the recognition, we managed to be part of people like Eddie Eastman and Minnie White which uh, held their own and did went on to do great things with or without us, you know. And th that was really good to be able to look up and say that. You know, we feel good about that. And uh, we're still playing today because we went on in, in the 80s, got back out of the country thing altogether. And by, by the late 80s, we revamped the band. Myself and Bob said, let's put together the band as a rock and roll band again. And we got myself and Bob, uh, Brother Roger, uh, and then we hooked up with Jim Ennessy, who was doing the Good Buddy Ollie show, or Gord Tracy doing the Elvis show, Paul Bradbury did the Julie Lewis, Ray Jivney did Roy Orbison, and we put all this in a package and did the rehearsals, put the show together, and we'll be all, here we go again, all over, something new, something different, hit Cornerbrook, hit Stephenville, uh, mainly around St. John's, of course, doing uh, mainly all the big events, uh, the convention circuit. We got into the convention circuit. And that went on until about, oh my, that went on until about 97. So we had a good stint of that. And that was really good fun years. These people were, they were all good people. They were all good musicians, good singers. We were lucky. We had, we always had... See, like we were always blessed with having the best of the best around at the time, you know, and that will we we can always brag about. We had the best singers and the good musicians and whatever. And I still enjoy playing my guitar. Right? And uh, here we are, still playing. Which the Dukes are still doing uh, a few shows, and I'm still set up. At uh, a few years later. Still enjoy playing guitar, whether it be uh, country, whether it be rock and roll, it don't matter to me. I just look for an excuse to go play, and if I don't play,
for a few weeks, I'd uh, probably pay somebody to let me come out and play with them. Still that way. Oh, the other the other aspect of the music business that we were in was getting to meet our arrows that we only heard on the radio and looked at their album covers. Uh, when we were in Boston, uh, setting out, Johnny and Eric Keynes was there on stage, and uh, we helped them take their gear down, and they helped us set ours up. And we couldn't believe it. Here we are mixing with John and Eric Keynes and, and having a great chat about their records and their big hits. Because this was Boston. This was Combat Zone. That's where, that's where we played. It wasn't a it wasn't healthy place. And uh, then we went on in Montreal. We met Little Richard. I had a little fun session with him and telling him how big inspiration he was to to not only the Dukas, but all the bands down here in Newfoundland. And in Toronto, we met Bill Ailey in the Comets, sat down and had a little session with them. And then in later years, a few years after that, we end up being connected up with Leslie Gore, because she was doing a, a tour of the province, and the Dukas was recommended to to back her up and work with her and get the rehearsals done and so on and so forth. So the spinoff, uh, other than playing guitar, was getting to meet all these people right up to... In the Nashville studio with Elvis's original band to call them friends and sit down and play with them, you know it made it all. It made the music trip a, a great thing because that studio we were in, with Pete Drake and uh, Scotty Moore and them, that's the same studio Paul McCarthy went in and did Sally G. That's the same studio that uh, Ringo Starr went in and did uh, Act Naturally, and all this stuff, you know, and and, and the the producer we have for our first record, A Woman became the producer for uh, John Lennon. So we were all in the right circles and had the right people around us and didn't really realize what in the hell we were doing, you know. We just wanted to get home and set up a music store. <laughs> ah, a lot of fun, though. Another memorable moment for the Deltones was probably in our first year. Uh, back in St. John's in those days, the most prestigious dance New Year's Eve was the old Connolly Club. It was a formal dance, and all the who's who of St. John's were going there. We were hired to play New Year's Eve. And I recall that that year, we were paid $400 for the old Connolly Club. That was the highest wage paid for bands in that era. And we were still young, no driver's license, etc. And I can remember walking home from the Old County Club, Tim, Jim, and I, down New Cove Road. I think it was snowing. And we had $400 in cash. And we decided to put it in Tim Chalker's sock uh, to avoid being mugged. And if we were mugged, then we wouldn't be hurt, but he would be. And uh, that's, that's how much we remember those kinds of days. It was laughable now, but $400 was astronomical in terms of money when we were used to getting like 30 and $40 for a dance. Another enjoyable moment for the Deltones, I think we did it three years, maybe four years in a row, was the annual Santa Claus Parade in St. John's. We used to play on the back of a flatbed. We had a generator going for the amplifiers and so on. And, of course, we had to behave ourselves because a lot of children were looking at us. We had to wave to them and smile and so on. And we loved to do it. The uh, Junior Chamber of Commerce, the JCs, used to ask us to do it for free. But we enjoyed it as much as anybody because it was fun and uh, you froze to death. I remember one of us had to cut the fingers out of our gloves because it was so cold. We had to play the guitars, of course. And Dave on the drums, of course, uh, the drums were brittle because it was freezing cold. But we really enjoyed that because it was part of Christmas and and Deltones used to enjoy Christmas like anybody else. Uh, early to mid 60s, uh, it was common practice for a lot of businesses downtown. Uh, to um, hire bands for advertisement, probably a Saturday afternoon, that, that sort of thing. And uh, I, re <laughs> uh, I remember one once we went down, uh, uh, I believe it was London, New York, and Paris, 
uh, and uh, we brought the gear down lunchtime. It was some Wayne Smith, I think, at the time. And uh, we brought the gear in, uh, loaded on the uh, freight elevator. Uh, we were directed to take the gear upstairs, which was a mistake, actually. We were supposed to play, to play downstairs. <laughs> so <laughs> we got on the elevator, <laughs> pressed the button to go up. The next thing I noticed, my guitar was disappearing. And <laughs> this all took place in a matter of seconds. Now, you get a picture of this. Here was the guitar disappearing. Wayne Smith made a dive for it. No, we didn't realize. It was a false back in the elevator, uh, trying to save it. And uh, actually, I, I was watching Wayne's hand, and it was a, a, like a ledge coming down. I was afraid the ledge would strike him. I remember pulling him back. Meanwhile, here was the stop button right by the side of my head. You know, I wouldn't have sense enough to just hit it and red and everything. Um, so anyway, the guitar, we eventually stopped the elevator, but halfway between the floors, uh, well up, uh, was approaching the top of the building, about almost four, four stories up. And uh, Wayne, I, I, I didn't know what to do, uh, so anyway, Wayne man managed to crawl out of the elevator, <laughs> went downstairs, bottom of the elevator shaft, there was no, there was no other recourse, only to let the guitar go. You know, he had to drag the guitar right up the side of the building then. So he put some old cardboard down that he got from the janitor down there and uh, broke my heart. I just had to offer the heel of me and me beetle boot at the time <laughs> and give it a revival. All I heard was spraying. <laughs> I went down, you know, the case was turned into a gig bag. And uh, the guitar picked it up, you know, wasn't even out of tune. I was going to write Leo Fender and tell him, you know. <laughs> I never did, I really should have. Because it all broke me heart. All the way down the stairs, I was thinking, well, I'll just go over to Mr. Hutt and get him to order me another one. Uh, I figured it was it was split in pieces, you know. I've still got the guitar to this day, and it's still as good as ever it was. I went out and played with it. It wasn't even out, out of tone. Uh, I believe Lou Skinner walked in that day. He came down to hear us, and uh, he may remember that <laughs> instant. But boy, <laughs> someone was watching out for me and my guitar that day. When well-known um, re recording artists uh, from away came to tour the province uh, back in those days, a lot of the times they they uh, hired local musicians to do the show with them. Uh, you rehearsed for a while, and uh, away you went. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, uh, back up a guy named uh, Kenny Chandler. He had uh, two or three hits out at the time during the early 60s. One was... Uh, uh, Hurt, and another one was uh, SOS Sweet on Susie. Uh, uh, myself and Tim Charter from the Deltones and uh, Gary Tilly from the Lincolns uh, did that job, and we toured the island and spent a while in uh, on the American Forces base in Argentia uh, with Kenny. And it was a real pleasure to play with him. He was a real pro, and uh, we learned a lot of a lot of things from him, you know, which we uh, went on to use ourselves. And uh, it was a very enjoyable uh, experience. <laughs>